be with you. And as I said to Kyle, I did go to City, and I did play football against Polly, and I think that you're the best. And uh, uh, it was a great rivalry, but it was a fun rivalry. <clears throat> Let me begin by telling you, I was born and raised in Baltimore. Uh, went to private uh, public schools here, and it's in my city. And in my last year at City, uh, I was supposed to graduate in June, but the war was going on in Europe, and uh, I was well aware of it because I was an avid reader, and I had a little radio that I used to listen to and hear about all the terrible things that were going on in Europe. <coughs> so my birthday was in March. I was supposed to graduate again in May. In March, I went down and enlisted in the Army and never finished, never got my graduation. Um, so I listed, went off to the Army, and the, uh, joined the Big Red One, the uh, famous uh, Army uh, Corps that uh, was founded before World War I and during World War I, and did wonderful things in all its uh, career. <coughs> Let me also say that um, I was born into a family with two brothers, two sisters, and we're Jewish. And we were not very observant, but we were Jewish. And uh, uh, we, I heard what was going on in Europe as far as Jews were concerned, and it bothered me very much. And probably that was one of the things that precipitated my enlist in the Army. Now, you have to understand something. As you heard, I was born in 1923. This past March, I was 93 years old. But I was always tall. I was old, like six feet two. I weighed about 185, 190 pounds. I was very athletic. I was strong, and I wouldn't tolerate anybody jumping in my face. If you jumped in my face, you had to fight me. <laughs> That's the way I was. I was just that kind of guy. So in the army, I was confronted with a lot of anti-Semitism. A lot of you, you Jew bastard, you kike and stuff like that. And when that happened, boom, we got into a fight. And I made my big mistake is when a sergeant said that to me and I hit him. Well, you don't do that. If you're private, you don't hit a sergeant. That's a no-no. So when that happened, that evening, he said, I want to see you behind the canteen. So back there, and I got a beating like I've never had. It was him, and I don't know what he knew. It sounded like it was 10 people, but I guess it was just him. But he had been trained and knew how to do it, but he really beat me bad. And then he said to me, why don't you join my company, my division? So that's how I got into the first division. We went to England. We trained there. How did we train? <clears throat> we trained mostly not firing guns and hand-to-hand -hand combat and so forth, because we had already been trained about that in the United States. Most of our training consisted of getting on ships, what we call the mother ship, and then climbing down the side of that ship on what are called cargo nets. There were no steps or gangways. They put these cargo nets alongside the ship, and you climbed over with your full equipment, and you worked your way down into a landing craft called the Higgins boat. This is a flat bottom boat, the paper front that came down into the water. And you had to come down the side of that ship into that boat, and then the boat took off for a landing. And that's what we practiced day in and day out. The first week we lost two people. You're on the ship, you're fully geared up, you've got about 120, 130 pounds of weight. You get alongside, you grab your hold of that netting, and you work your way down. Two people, on different ships, slipped and fell. And when they fell into the water, there was no way to get them out. There was no way you could strip that 120 pounds off them, and they drowned. So we lost two people in that training exercise. While in England, uh, we did get some passes. And I got a pass one night, uh, it was for a weekend, a group of six of us, and we went to London. And we went to see the late Glenn Miller's band. Glenn Miller and his band were all killed in an airplane crash during the war. 
It was a great jazz band, and we all went to see him in, in London. And it was a great event. The reason I'm telling you that is that I told you I grew up with all this anti-Semitism and so forth. When we got there, we're looking around, and I see these women in a uniform, and I turned around to one of my friends, and I said, uh, who are those women? He said, they're wax. I said, what's a whack? He said, they're Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, American soldiers. I said, you got to be kidding. No, what are you doing here? They brought them over <coughs> to handle a mail distribution and so forth so that they released men to go fight. Well, I'd never heard of that. But while I'm looking, I'm walking over, I see one young lady, an African American. She looks at me and I looked at her. And she grabbed me and started to hug me, and I'm grabbing her, and we're hugging each other, and we're crying. And she was from South Boston, where I grew up, right here in Baltimore. I knew her as a child. We both knew each other. And so we started dancing. And you know, throughout the whole night, we had a fabulous evening. When it was all over, and uh, we left, say goodbye to her and so forth, and we left. And we're walking down the street now. London had been exposed and was being exposed to a lot of air raids by German planes. <clears throat> All of a sudden, I felt something hit me in my side and my head, and I went down. And I thought, it must have been a raid. We didn't hear the siren. So, and then I felt something hit me in my lower right back. And I didn't know what was going on. I rolled over, and then I saw this boot coming at me, another boot. And I covered myself up. <clears throat> The five guys that were with me, three of them were from the South. One from a place I'd never heard of called in Plains, Georgia. If you remember, Jimmy Carter, President Carter, came from there. And he called me everything but the Son of God. Mm -hmm. I was this kind of lover and that kind of lover because I was dancing with uh, Rebecca and so forth. And she was black and he wasn't. In those days, it just, just didn't happen. And so I took a real beating, had two busted ribs and so forth. But anyway, it seemed that fate took care of that because I lost two of them on the invasion. After that, we were all sent down to southern England. There were just hundreds and hundreds, well, literally, there were actually hundreds of thousands or a couple of million troops along that southern coast of England. And the equipment like you have never seen. Guns just piled up, trucks of four by fours, jeeps, piles, mountains of cake rations, and just unbelievable. And we knew that we were getting ready for invasion of Europe. In the meantime, the Air Force, the Allied Air Force, the British, Americans, so were keeping the skies clear. The uh, Allied Navy was keeping the waters clear, the German submarines, and so forth. And we were still going out practicing. And one day in June, we got a call, get ready to get on board. And so we were all issued live ammunition, live grenades, and we boarded the ship. And they called the mothership, and we took off. And they said at that time, there was an expression, there were so many ships in the English Channel that you could have walked from England to France and never got your feet wet, which was not true, but that's how many ships were in that channel, the English Channel. The sky was covered with airplanes, all kinds of planes, bombers, fighters, observation craft, what have you. And we knew that this was a, this was a day, this was D-Day. And so we went in. At 7.30, we had the second uh, wave, and we came down off the boat, onto the landing craft. And the landing craft came in, and the Germans had had all kinds of fortifications in the water, they had mines everywhere, and we got uh, Boat came in, dropped its uh, front, we came off the boat. We're lucky, we're in about two and a half, three feet of water. Some of the people came off the boat, we weren't so lucky. They were in five, six feet of water, and a lot of them drowned. We lost a lot of people through drowning. As soon as we got off the boat and walked through the water, pushed our way up on the beach, and we weren't not, we hadn't covered 200 yards before I had lost 40% of my platoon. Two guys I told you were in Georgia, they were killed. They were the first two to be killed. Mines went off and they were shot. They you know, just destroyed. We had people killed by machine gun fire. But we did get lucky because there were fortifications on the right and left. This was Omaha Beach. 
And one of our ships, a destroyer or something, had beached itself and lowered its guns and knocked out the fortification on the left. So all we had was this heavy gunfire coming in from the right, which was a lot better than this crisscross fire. We were finally able to fight our way off the beach about 300 yards up into the, what was called the hedgerows. And the hedgerows were um, mounds of dirt, actually, it just wasn't bushes. And we were Germans on one side, up, we were on the other, and we had to fight our way up through that. We fought our way up and through uh, the hedgerows into what is a town called St. Mary Eglise. The 101st Airborne Division, the 82nd Airborne Division had dropped and were t trying to take it. And they were stuck at one end, we were the other side. So we moved in together and we took that town. Then we moved into a town called Camonton, Coutances, and fought our way across France until we got into Poland. And during the whole time, even by the time we left the ships, the British were on our left flank, the 29th Division in the United States was on our right flank, and we kept the spearhead. We lost a lot of people that first day, a lot of people. When we got up near Belgium, I got hit, and I was out for about two weeks, three weeks, and it came back. I thought, sure, I was going home, but I didn't, and I brought, came back to my outfit. <coughs> and in Belgium, in Holland, the British were pinned down, and they were trying to move into the town of Mag, I think it was called, and they couldn't get their tanks across the uh, bridges. So we came in, some engineers, set up new bridges, moved them across, and fought with them there. While we were there, the Germans were using a lot of artillery. So they needed somebody as an artillery spotter. And I said, OK, I'll try it. So I went upstairs, up out in a barn up in the loft, and I lay up there for two days. And I was in that barn watching every night with glasses to see where the fire was coming from and then calling it back to our people so they could direct fire against that. The reason I'm telling you that incident, I want you to remember, is something else I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, why it was important. Then we moved into Belgium, <coughs> and then that became what was called the Battle of Bulge. Why was the Battle of Bulge? We were moving in, British, American, French, Polish troops, moving in, pushing the Germans, fighting Germans, <coughs> but Hitler decided he was going to knock us out. He was going to have a real push and get to Amsterdam, which was the main, Antwerp, the main port, and shut off all our supplies. Had he done so, it would have been a different ball game. The war would not have been the war. So when he started this push with everything he had, <coughs> and he created this bulge in our lines, if you can imagine that I'm standing here and people are pushing me, pushing me, pushing me, and this became known as the Battle of the Bulge. We were then sent into the Hurricane Forest, which was on the, um, the um, southeastern part of the bulge try and uh, get some, to alleviate some of the pressure. And we took a lot of losses. There. We lost over 15,000 troops in that battle because of the heavy artillery and what happened. The weather was so bad, and we were not equipped to fight that kind of fight. We had to go in the houses, stores and stuff, and take sheets off of beds, off of uh, tablecloths, and we'd wrap them around us and we'd camouflage ourselves over our brown uniforms. And finally, Patton, the Third Army, came up from the south. We were able to win that battle of the bulge and moved in from there into Germany. We went across the Siegfried Line into the town of Aachen, Germany. Aachen, Germany was the first largest German city that we entered. It took us almost three weeks or more to take the city of Aachen, Germany. Um, I used to with the target name with the bowling alley. Why? I had all my men take grenades, little grenades, and stuff them in their bags and everywhere I could carry them. And as we proceeded down the streets and the, the, the roads of this town, we'd throw them in the stores, in the houses, the basements, everywhere, and just blast them out because we didn't know when anybody behind us, we didn't know what was in there. We didn't look to see if there were men, women, children, or dogs or cats in there. 
We just wanted to make sure that there was nothing in there that could destroy us as we moved ahead. We were given instructions to try not to destroy certain things like churches and so forth. But when you've got somebody sitting up in a church steeple with a machine gun, you're not going to just walk by them. You're going to try to kill them. So we knocked out a lot of those. We proceeded into Germany, and we got up into what area was the Weimar Republic area. And my colonel said, why don't you take a reconnaissance unit out? and see if where we are and whether or not the, the third is coming up. Because the third army was coming up from the south, that was General Patton's army. We were coming up from the northeast, and it was like a pincer movement. We would envelop the German army there, and probably 150,000 German troops we would annihilate, or at least take prisoner or whatever. 